Mm. Yeah. Okay, man. Y'all. So, like, uh, I have no idea. I'm experimenting right now. So, uh, if I'm doing this wrong, I am not going to know it. Because I've been doing this with the... Uh, and I've been doing this uh, Facebook Live thing in the selfie mode, and I'm trying to refresh my page, hoping, I guess I should experiment with this early, but I figured, you know, hey, might as well go ahead and try to start experimenting right now. Okay, looks like I got an image happening, and I don't really know if I'm centered or not. I don't know how much headroom I got or whatever, but I think I got, I may have something going on here. Is it looking okay? Are we looking? Are we looking all right? Am I squared? Am I centered and stuff? Do I look fine? <laughs> yeah. So check this out. Um, I didn't have any coffee left over, uh, but I did have some decaf. Now, I love coffee, so I have decaf coffee for like later on in the evening, right? And uh, you know, because but I just want to have that coffee flavor. You know, I just you know have a little decaf. But you know, when it's before six, you know, right at six, you know, I don't. I usually don't do decaf. You know, right at six. But that was all I had because I drank all my other stuff, and I didn't and I didn't boogie on down to the store and get some more. So like you know, smoking, smoking, <laughs> Freudian slip there. Uh, drinking coffee is you know drinking decaf coffee is like uh, you know smoking cigarette butts. You know, when, when you really want to have coffee and all there is is, is like a decaf coffee. And so I'm drinking decaf right now. But what I did was I had some caffeinated tea. So I, <laughs> I brewed some like caffeinated tea and I put some of my decaf coffee in there. And so I'm kind of like drinking this, you know, kind of concoction, this compensated concoction of, of, of caffeinated tea and decaf coffee. We'll, we'll see how it works in a little bit. All right. So... Okay, so I'm, I'm going to check out the feed real quick just to make sure I'm squared up because I can't, I, I, I can't totally tell, you know, it's doing it like in real time. So uh, if I miss you, if I don't say anything, it's not because I'm not paying attention or anything like that. I'm just, I'm not totally confident how this feed is working. So I can't really, is it feeding right now? Oh, come on. Now, David, give me a break. Give me a break. I know you decaf, but it's doing the trick. I'm desperate. All right. Ah, uh, thank you guys for showing up. Let's get this, let's get this trip going. Oh, before I get started, so YouTube, YouTube sent me another, uh, kept, it's, it's, you know, they, they send me these emails telling me that they're not monetizing my videos. You know, it's like they want to rub it in. We're not going to monetize your videos. Man. We hate you. You know, so they, they keep sending me emails. We're not going to monetize your videos. Um, and so I, you know, I emailed, um, uh, um, and they, when they send me these emails, they send them to me from different addresses, right? So they send me the email. We're not going to, you know, monetize such and such video. And, um, you know, so I wrote, you know, I write YouTube back and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Is, uh, you're not going to monetize my video. What's the matter? Do I not, you know, curse enough? Do I not call women the B word enough? Do I not use the N word enough? Do I not, am I not profane enough? Did I not, did I, am I not objectifying women enough? And, uh, and, and not giving myself the license to do that by promoting the, the murder of the unborn? Is that why you guys won't monetize my videos? Uh, is it because I'm not uh, promoting homosexuality enough? Am I not showing enough nudity in my videos or something like that? Is that why you guys aren't monetizing my videos? Because you can go on YouTube and you can see them monetizing videos with all this stuff. They're promoting drugs. They're calling. They're just objectifying women. Uh, and they're saying all these lewd and crude and nasty things. And they monetize their videos. Um, you know, there's even videos out there where you can see nudity. Uh, there's, there's videos where they show nudity. And they still monetize those videos. And a lot of these videos don't even belong to the person who uploaded them. And they'll still monetize those videos. But my videos, they won't monetize. So I called them out on their hypocrisy. And, um, you know, so this time, and then, so they sent me another one saying, we're not going to monetize your videos. And I, and, I, and I just sent the same thing back to them. And this time it was like a, a improper address or something like that. So they basically blocked me from uh, sending back uh, my, my retort to them. So uh, yeah, that 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 really sucks. I mean, I understand, you know, it's a, it's a private business; they can do whatever they want. Um, but I also have the right to call them out on their hypocrisy, and it's evident that uh, they make sure that you know it's a limited amount of people who can see my videos. P 
people who are subscribed to my channel, they don't get the notifications that my videos go out. So they affect the numbers of how many people see my videos and um, they, they cancel monetization for my videos. And I think, I think the weak excuse that they use uh, is that my videos are called the Zoloft. So they're leaning on this weak loophole to, I guess, say that I'm like maybe like, um, you know, infringing on a trademark name or something like that. Or I'm, I'm promoting the use of drugs. And, uh, well, you guys already monetize videos where people are out there glorifying smoking weed and stuff like that. I don't glorify the use of drugs. And my video being called this video, video is being called the Zoloft. Uh, you can't trademark the name Zo, right? And you can't trademark the word loft. It's the Zoloft. You know, that's, that's my thing. You know, the Zoloft drug, that's something else. So I'm not competing with an already existing drug. I'm not selling a drug. I'm promoting a commentary. They're, they're two totally different franchises or whatever. So, um, but anyway, I imagine that that's their little loophole that they're trying to use to, to like stick it to me. And I personally like the name Zoloft. And uh, so, you know, the Zoloft is for, you know, these, uh, these manic depressive liberals that are out there. And uh, I use my videos to <laughs> appeal to their, their disorder. And it's for, for my conservatives, hey, it's chuckle therapy for, for us, you know, because, you know, these liberals, they tend to get us in a pretty foul mood. And you know what? Let's, let's, let's take some time to, to, to make fun of their absurdity. And so the Zoloft is like my chuckle therapy for my fellow conservatives where we just have a place where, you know, we just... You know, instead of being all mad, we just get back and we just laugh at these people for a little bit. You know, so that's what the Zoloft is. And um, I guess YouTube isn't open-minded enough to handle that. But, hey, that's where, uh, you know, so when people say you're just pre preaching to the choir, it's like, no, I'm not. If I put my videos up on YouTube, I am certainly not preaching to the choir. You guys obviously haven't read my hate mail, as I've, if I, as I've said before. So, uh, no, I, I keep my videos up on YouTube because, hey, you know, hopefully uh, somebody out there who's not totally hardwired will hear it. And, uh, you know, might as, when you, it doesn't do much good to have, like, let YouTube just fully run amok with liberal ideology. You might want to have a, a few of us in there, you know, kind of helping to, you know, set the record straight. And uh, uh, but what, that's, that's an interesting I, idea. Uh, the, the zone is, nah, nah, it's, it's got to be something zone. That's, it's like a stretch too much to call it the zone. Uh, you know, but something Zo, you know, but the Zoloft is cool. I, you know, if, uh, you know, if YouTube doesn't want to monetize it, that's fine. You know, it sucks, but the Lord's got my back and he'll make, uh, he'll make other arrangements. The Lord makes a way. All right. So anyway, that's my little, my little soap boxing. And, uh, let's see what we can get out of, let's see what we can get out of Mark. Continue on with Mark. Like I said, I'm just reading through these, you know, chapter after chapter, verse by verse. You know, that way, you know, we're here together, you know, seeing what the word says. Not about what Zoe says. It's about what the word says. So we're just reading it. You guys are just, you know, here tracking with me, tripping with me. And I'm going to start from, uh, uh oh, 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 man. Okay, I remember my copy this time. But. Oh, uh oh. Yeah. There it is. Y'all know that song? Come on, type it in, type it in. If you know that song, put it in there. Put it in there, V. Who knows what's coming? When I wake up in the morning, love, and the sunlight hurts my eyes. Yeah. Thank you, Danelle. I know you got my back, buddy. And they'll be like, I got your six, homie. Sonia, there you go. All right with me. Just want to look at you. All right, I want everybody to sing it. Even if you got to type it in there. Like, type it. Type it in there. A lovely day. Lovely day. Lovely day, lovely day, lovely day, lovely day, lovely day. That's my jam. Okay, cut that down a little bit. Yes. <laughs> okay, I like that. The Twilight Zone. But you know, 
I love it. No, because that's what I'm trying to point out is that the liberals are trying to drag us into. So speaking of which, yeah, you're right. The Twilight Zone. And I hope you guys keep sharing um, the video that I made, Sinisterbia, which is made in the vein of the Twilight Zone. Make sure you catch that video. Make sure you share it, guys. It's, a, it's a, uh, one of my ways of like uh, pointing out that left-wing absurdity. So uh, make sure after the video, you guys dig up my video, Sinisterbia, and keep sharing it so we can get support for it. All right. So let's see. All right, I'm going to start from, where am I going to start from? Okay, let's dig it from um, Mark 14:28. Mark 14:28. All right. But after I have been resurrected, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Right there. Let's freeze right there really quick. Okay, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Jesus hit them with like a secret password. He hit them with a code word. Because remember, when Jesus comes back, right, when they go looking for him at the tomb, and you got the different accounts of saying how they saw him, like, you know, uh, uh, who saw him first and whatever, it's, there's going to be different, a little bit of uh, different details. But one of the details that Jesus says, he says, go and tell them that I'll meet them in Galilee, right? This is heavy because Jesus is letting them, he says, but after I have resurrected, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. So that was like one of those things when, when she comes back and she gives a report. Jesus says to go ahead and meet him in Galilee. He's going to meet us in Galilee. This should be like, what, wait, what, what? That really is Jesus because Jesus said that he is going to go ahead of us to Galilee, to, to Galilee. So that's awesome, right? So right there, he's giving them the secret password because only he would know that. Um, so, Peter told them, so Peter told them, even if everyone runs away, I certainly will not. I assure you, Jesus said to him, today, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, homie, you're going to deny me three times. But he kept insisting, if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And they all said the same thing. Okay, so I did a video earlier, guys, where I was talking about, um, you know, in their heart, they mean what they say. They, they mean it, right? Their spirit, they're, they're, they're in this, right? They're, they're in the fight, because that's what they think is coming. They're ready to fight at Jesus' side. They're willing to die fighting at Jesus' side. They didn't know. They didn't understand that they were going to, that what Jesus talks like, no, dude, there's not going to be a fight. I'm actually going to hand over my life. They don't understand that. Okay? Um, so they're willing to fight. Now, then they come to a place named Gethsemane. And he told his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him. And he began to be deeply distressed and horrified. Hey, Nancy. Hey. <laughs> Am I going to have to give you a tardy slip and send you to the principal? I'm, I'm glad you're here. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Um, okay. Uh-oh. Am I breaking up? Somebody said that I'm breaking up. Boo. Okay, I must be back good. I must be good now. Okay. Um, so he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and horrified. Then he said to them, My soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake. Then he went a little farther, fell to the ground, and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Okay, so guys, listen, for, for anybody, you know, we, we got things that we're going through, you know. And, you know, we be praying, we be praying, you know, looking for the Lord's resolve in this. You know, and we, and we sometimes feel like, you know, God's not listening to us. God is listening. And God does answer our prayers. Sometimes God says no. Um, you're looking at this right now. This is the son, the son of God praying until he's sweating blood, right? And his ideal, the thing that he would want is, you know, I want this cup to pass for me. And Lord, hey, you're the big boss, man. I'm sure you can make this happen. If there's any way that you can make this happen, that would be fantastic. And Jesus's prayer was not answered. Ultimately, the interest of Jesus for the will of God to be done. Not his own will, but it's like, look, God, if there's any other way, that would really be fantastic. Okay? So even in this instance, God said no. So don't feel like, you know, that God is going to answer all of our prayers according to our ideals. 
Okay? That doesn't mean that God loves us any less. The thing is, is that we are born in a sinful world. Evil is our neighbor. Rotten things are going to happen. You know, that's, it sucks, but if these things didn't happen, well, this would be heaven now, wouldn't it? But this ain't heaven. This is earth. This is a, the, the, the earth is in a is in a cursed state. The Lord has 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 promised us that He will be there on the other side waiting for us, or He will lead, help to lead us through and give us the endurance to go through this world. But we're gonna have some. It's gonna be some bumpy times. So in this right here, you know, Jesus didn't get his prayer answered according to his ideals, but his ultimate ideal was to be in the will of of, of his Father. Now here's the other thing. I got some flat. Because um, I said that Jesus, Jesus himself is not omniscient. He's not all-knowing, right? And I, oh, oh Christians, they, I got some Christians that got mad at me for that, boy. Um, because I was pointing towards Jesus when he was on the cross. One of his final statements was, Father, my God, my, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's asking the question. Christians came in and say, "So he was, he was, he was quoting David. He was, quoting, and he was you know, and so it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that. I, I, I understand that. But in quoting David, he was still asking the question. He's still asking the question. My God, why are you, for, why are you forsaking me? And he's asking that, y'all, because he doesn't totally know the score. He doesn't know the full scope of what's going on. If he did know, then he would not be operating in faith, now would he? And if he did know." He wouldn't have the faith to be totally obedient. That's what this is about, y'all. It's obedience. He was obedient to the point of death. Even right here, you can see he's asking the question, if it's possible, God, if Jesus is all-knowing, right? Jesus is all <laughs> I got people still trying to come up with names. Hey, concentrate on the word. We, we passed we pass coming up with names for my show. We, let's, let's, let's concentrate on the word. Let's concentrate on the word. But thank you guys. I appreciate it. Okay, listen. Just right here, Jesus is letting you know that he's not in the full know. If Jesus knew of any other way, he suggested to God. He said, hey, God, maybe we could do it like this. But Jesus is not fully in the know. Showing that Jesus is totally obedient. If Jesus was fully in the know, there wouldn't be a point of, of, of faith where I would there. There would be no point of obedience. So I hope, you know, folks will understand that. That's what makes Jesus so super awesome. That's what makes him a man's man. That's what makes him the king of kings. Because he did have this state of vulnerability. But despite that, he says, I'm moving forward. I'm yours, Lord. Right? Why have you forsaken me? But... Into your hands I commit my spirit. Meaning that I don't fully understand this, God. I don't fully get it. But you know what? I'm all yours. I'm fully committed to what it is that you're doing, even if I don't fully understand it. So Jesus himself had to sacrifice his omniscience to be totally obedient in faith. All right? So it's, it's telling you right here. Telling you in the scriptures right here. Um, then he went a little farther. Fell to the ground. And begin to pray that if it were possible, okay, we read that, all things are possible for you. Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. What's up, Matthew? You in there? Okay, then he came and found them sleeping. Simon, man, get up, dude. Why are you sleeping? He asked Peter, couldn't you stay awake <laughs> just for one hour, man? Hey, look here. You need some coffee, right? <laughs> you need some coffee, Peter? Stay awake, man. Okay, because you know, you know, it's be, be, be tripping, man. If you fall asleep, you fall asleep on your watch. Don't fall asleep on your watch. Uh, he asked Peter, couldn't you stay awake for one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. Okay, Peter, Jesus is letting him know, dude, right? You got you to keep your integrity, man, because temptation is going to come upon you and you're going to fall into it. And we're going to see that in just a little bit. Um, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Actually, you know, I'm going to touch on that right now because you know me, I'll forget. Okay. The temptation that is going to fall on Peter is to run. Now, once again, Peter means it. It's like, look, man, I'm ready to die with you, man. But Peter thought that there was going to be a fight. Peter's ready for the war. Peter is not ready to just give over his life, just walk into the hands of just and to be slaughtered. That's not what Peter's looking to do. He thinks that he's following Jesus into a fight. 
Now, when the temptation to, to run hits Peter, Peter is going to give into temptation and he's going to run. He's going to think about his own life, but he wants to fight. And since there's not going to be a fight, he's going to run. And Jesus lets him know right here. Then he came and found them sleeping. Oh, uh, sorry. The spirit, he tells them, the spirit is willing. I know your spirit is willing, Peter, but your flesh is weak and you're going to get and you're going to get scared because you're not going to be able to fight and you're going to run. Once again, he went away and prayed, saying the same thing. And he came again and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. Then, so sorry, they did not know. They didn't know what to say. It was like, dang, Jesus, I don't know what to say, man. I, I'm, just, I'm just really sleepy, bro. Um, they didn't know what to say to him. Then he came a third time and said to them, you are still sleeping. Get your behind up, man. All right, you're still sleeping and resting. Enough. The time has come. Look, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. My betrayer is near. Okay, so look here. Now, this is giving you, Jesus has already called Peter out three times. Peter, Jesus is, Jesus is upset with him because like, dude, you went to sleep on me three times. You went to sleep on me three times. And because you're doing this, man, you are going to fall into temptation. Jesus is warning him right now. You went to sleep on me three times, just as you are going to deny me three times. I'm your rooster, man. The rooster, the, the rooster, the bird that, that cockadoodle doos to wake people up. I'm your rooster right now. I'm coming to wake you up and tell you, you are going to deny me three times if you don't stay awake. And when Jesus was delivered into the hands and they came asking Peter, said, yo, what's it, Peter? What's up, Peter? I know you, man. And Peter's like, no, I don't know you. G and Peter still went to sleep on Jesus three times. Hey, so he denied Jesus three times. And Jesus was giving him a picture of that before they even got started. So while he was speaking, Judas, one of the 12, suddenly arrived, suddenly arrived with him with a mob, with swords and clubs from the chief priests and scribes and the elders. His betrayer had given them the signal. Oh, just really quick. What's up, y'all? Hey, I see some more people coming in. Thank you, guys. How you doing, Nancy, Kristen, Linda, Doug? What's up? Okay. Um, they came with clubs from the chief priests, from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. His betrayer had given them a signal. The one I kiss, he said, he's the one. Arrest him and take him away under guard. So now, now one would ask, okay, now Jesus, now once again, we already covered that, um, you know, Jesus is, is, is sacrificed some of his omniscience. Jesus still knows human behavior. Now, one would ask, it's like, you know, if Jesus is so smart, why would he pick people who would betray him? Why would he do that? That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't sound like a really smart guy. Um, you guys, who does Peter, I mean, who does Jesus really have to pick from? We're all imperfect. We're all inherently wicked people. All of us. Hey, so Jesus picked, he probably picked the 12 people who were the least likely to screw him over. Hey, but no matter who Jesus picked, he's going to pick 12 people and at least one of them is going to screw him over because that's the world, y'all. That's who we are. So Jesus was going to, it was inevitable for him to have a betrayer in his midst. And that one happened to be Judas. So it's not that Jesus isn't, you know, smart enough to know who he's going to pick. It's just, that's just what we are, guys. We, we kind of suck. You know, and it's just chances were, you know, well, the odds are is that Jesus was going to end up picking somebody that was going to betray him. Um, you know, so, you know, and Judas, um, you know, one would also ask, well, did Judas operate on his free will because um, the devil got into him? Well, Judas, the devil didn't really get Judas to do anything that wasn't already in his heart. The devil just capitalized on what was in Judas's heart. So Judas, Judas was already he already he was already self-righteous. Remember how we were talking about uh, how Judas was coveting somebody else's wealth. Jesus, Judas was already a thief. He was stealing from the treasury. But he was also assuming to be more, more righteous than Jesus because he's trying to tell somebody else, hey, you know, we could have spent that money, you know, that money, all that perfume that she's pouring on your head and stuff, we could have spent that money and gave it to the poor. So, Jesus, so Judas, like a Democrat, is coveting somebody else's wealth and already trying to dictate to what somebody else is going to do with their wealth. Democrats have a Judas mentality, by the way. You know, and I've, I've mentioned that to y'all before. So Jesus is like, you know what, you need to leave her alone. Right. What she does is she that's, that's her, it's her business and she's doing something nice for me, you know, because I'm about to do something real nice for all of y'all. 
So, um, so that, you know, just to kind of, you know, put it in a nutshell, Judas wasn't operating totally outside of his free will. He was already a wicked person. The devil just capitalized on it. All right, so now we got, came up and said, the one um, I kiss, that's him. Now, I've, I've heard a, a pastor uh, made a, make a very interesting point about that. You know, the Bible says that Jesus wasn't in particularly, uh, you know, it'll, it'll tell you in the scriptures that he's not particularly, you know, this amazing person to look at. He, he's not somebody that you would look at and say, wow, that person should be king. You know, he, 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 didn't, he wasn't a stunning figure. Um, I imagine he was probably, you know, probably had some, you know, yoked up a little bit since he's a carpenter and stuff like that. You know, did a lot of traveling and things. But um, it wasn't like he was like this amazing person to behold where you're like saying, wow, he looks like royalty. So Judas actually had to, you know, point him out. He had to go up to him and say, hey, Rabbi, what's up, bro? You know, give me some love, sugar, sugar, you know, right? And that's how they knew who he was. Because other than that, they wouldn't have figured Jesus, you know, this guy is, is the king. So, um, so from there... Uh, la, 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 la. That's my that's my new nervous tape. La, 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 la. Instead of going. Doo, 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 doo. <laughs> oh wait! Oh no 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 no! I thought about it. Did I do it? Have I said right yet? Never mind. Never mind. I'm trying to get it out of my head. Okay. So when he came right up to him and said, "Rabbi," kissed him. Then they took hold of him and arrested him. And one of those who stood by drew his sword. That was Peter. Stood by, drew his sword, struck the high priest slave. And cut off his ear. Like I said, y'all, Peter is ready to fight. That wasn't no willy-nilly, ah, you know, and, and cut off this dude's ear. Okay, that was, a, that was a skillful stroke. Peter could throw down, right? He was good with the sword. That's why he pulled it out and whacked off this dude's ear. That's good aim. He was a skilled warrior. And Jesus knew he was going to do it. Because if Jesus didn't know, if Jesus, Jesus could have told us, like, dude, don't bring your weapons. But Jesus, Jesus wanted his men. He wants us to be armed, armed and ready, right? Armed and ready, but not looking for a fight, but looking to protect what we're blessed with. That's the difference. Okay? So now Jesus goes off and, and, and ganks this dude in the ear, right? But Jesus said to them, have you come out with swords and clubs as though I was a criminal to capture me? Every day when I was among you teaching in the temple complex and you didn't arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. They then all deserted him and ran away. Now a certain young man, having linen cloths wrapped around his naked body, was following him. They caught him. <laughs> but he left him. He left the landing cloth behind and ran away butt naked. Okay. This reminds me of like an episode of Cops or something like that where you got some dude is like trying to streak or something like that. The cops are trying to get a hold of him and grab him like that. He's like, no, no, get off me. Uh, uh, stop it. Stop it. And just runs away down the street just naked, just butt naked, just running down the street. And that was this dude. Probably Mark. Right. Some some um, scholars speculate that it was probably Mark who made this account, who was following the whole thing and then recorded it. <laughs> but that, I just imagine that to be a, 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 a somewhat funny scene. OK, now let's back up a little bit. Um, now, just as I said, I had said earlier, um, I've said before that uh, in, in the last one um, about Jesus not drinking the wine, he can't drink the wine. Because it's Passover wine. And, um, you know, being that it's Passover wine, he can't drink it because if he drinks it, then death will pass over him. So he can't, you know, he won't be able to do his work on the cross. Um, now, here's a, and, um, now, as far as the war, um, you know, when they come to arrest Jesus, they, you know, like I said, they think they're going into battle. Jesus can't go into battle with them. Okay? And the reason why he can't go into battle, oh, and just really quick. Uh, before I go on, my feed looks like it's kind of stopped. If somebody could type in really quick uh, that my feed is still going, that I still got a connection, that would be great. I'll just wait a second to see if somebody types that in because uh, it looks like my feed is stopped. And then we're going to have that dead silence, which is going to make it really awkward. So what I will do... Ah, oh, there you go. Thank you, Michael. I was going to just, just sip really loud to fill in the dead air space. All right. Okay, so check this out. We had talked about um, Jesus drinking that Passover, uh, that Passover wine. Okay, here's the other thing. This is another reason why Jesus can't go into battle with them right now. He can't go into battle with them right now because Jesus, when he when he when he was at that Last Supper, and they drank, uh, they um, you know they were drinking that wine, but Jesus refrained from it, is because Jesus had taken a Nazarite vow right there. Jesus wasn't under the Nazarite vow before that because he was drinking wine before that. And remember, Jesus was also healing people, bringing people from back from the dead, right? If you're under the Nazarite vow, one, you cannot drink wine. 
You can't eat, you can't eat of, of the grape at all. Okay, but Jesus was, he did drink wine. Two, if you're under Nazarite vow, you cannot touch the dead. You can't even be around the dead. And we know that in the early scriptures, Jesus was around the dead. He brought people back from the dead. So being under, now at this last supper, Jesus takes the Nazarite vow. And one of the reasons when they come to, when they bring their clubs and stuff like that, and they bring their swords, they bring their little armada to come to arrest Jesus. And Jesus got his homies with him, flanked up and strapped and ready to go. Jesus cannot commit them to war because if he does, well, there's going to be dead bodies all around Jesus, right? They can't, they, Jesus can't be among the fight because he's under the Nazarite vow. If people, if bodies start dropping in the middle of that war, Jesus will have, a, will have brought a curse on himself. So he can't commit to war. He has to hand himself over. He has to. So a war doesn't break out and he's surrounded by dead bodies, which is not permissible and when you're under the Nazarite vow. Now, the other thing is, um, you know, people, you know, try to make this uh, discrepancy about uh, Nazareth and stuff like that. You know, you got those who try to say that, um, and I'm doing research on this myself, guys. I'm not, I'm not fully concluded on this. Um, I'm still trying to, to, to find out what the deal is. Um, you have those who say that Nazareth itself wasn't even a city until like, what, 300 years after um, the death of Jesus. So how could Jesus be from Nazareth? Okay, now I haven't done, I haven't found it yet uh, where the, the, the counter argument to that is, but I offer you this. Jesus being a Nazarene, when they refer to Jesus or they, 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 they refer to people from uh, as a Nazarene, it's like a pejorative, right? It's like a derogatory statement when you call somebody else. So when you say Jesus from Nazareth, Nazareth isn't like a place that you would find on the map. Okay, uh, Nazareth is kind of like a, it's like conditions, it's, it's like a mindset, um, it's like a, a condition of a certain area. So Jesus was from Galilee, right, he's, he's this Galilean, but Nazareth is this place in Galilee. So, like say for instance, and you'll see um, in the scriptures, you'll, you'll have somebody say that, what, what, what good comes out of Nazareth? Ain't nothing good come out of Nazareth. And it's not like Nazareth is this town or city or anything like that. To say to somebody, it's like, you know, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. It's like the same thing saying, man, nothing good comes out of the ghetto, right? Nothing good comes out of the projects. Nothing, you know, the, these, these, these spoiled, you know, kids who live in, a, in, in, their, in their fancy neighborhoods and stuff like that. These, these kids from the sur suburbs, what good comes out of the suburbs except for spoiled, rotten kids? What good, you know, it's like, you know, we, if you guys have probably heard of like the hood. You can't find the hood on the map. It's not like an actual city. Um... So, but we know, but we have an idea of where the hood is. You have an idea of what, you know, it's like, is there a city called the Barrio? All right, there might be, but, but you get my point. You go to a certain city and say, hey, where's the, you know, where's the Barrio? It's not like an actual city, but it's an area of a certain town. Um, so like I said, when we talk about, you know, the hood, the projects, the ghetto, um, the suburbs, you know, these aren't necessarily places on the map, but you've got an idea of what they're talking about. Now, it could be very well mean that that's the same Connotation that they're saying Nazareth. It's oh Jesus from Nazareth. What good comes out of Nazareth? It's like a it's like a um, a condition of a certain aspect of town that he would coming from that he'd be coming from. So I I offer you that. Um, you know I'm just kind of like squaring that by how different cultures are. We've seen that all throughout cultures. You don't have to necessarily be talking about a specific city or a town, but you know what town they're talking about when you refer to it in a certain way. Um, let's see. Uh, hope that makes some sense. And okay, so we were at uh, 51, no, 53. Okay, they led Jesus away to the high priest. And the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes convened. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the chief priest, right into the high priest's court. He was sitting with the temple popo, warming himself by the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin. We're looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they could find none. So, I mean, they, they know, they, it's like, it's, well, we'll get into this in a second. This, they know, they, they know they, that Jesus is, is an innocent man. It's, it, and at some point, they're just going to say it flat out, he was an innocent guy. Uh, and they didn't want blood money on their hands. Because they, they knew, they knew what the deal was. Just didn't accept it. Once again, guys... Demons know who Jesus is. They just don't accept his rule. And he said, that's why Jesus says, you're like, the, you're like your father the devil. The devil knows who I am. 
But the devil just doesn't accept my rule. And you're just like him. You guys know who I am. You just don't accept it. <clears throat> um, the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they could find none. For many were giving false testimony against him. But the testimonies did not agree. Some stood up and were giving false testimony against him, saying, we heard him, so we heard him say, I will demolish this sanctuary made by human hands, and in three days I will build another not made by hands. Yet their testimony did not agree even on this. So it's almost like the Sanhedrin, they had their own personal reasons for why they wanted to kill Jesus. And it was the Sanhedrin wanted to kill Jesus with such a selfish spirit that they didn't even want anybody else to intrude on why they wanted to kill Jesus. Like, look here, we gonna kill Jesus for our own personal reasons, to satisfy our selfishness. You don't get none of it, right? So don't be coming in here and telling us all this, 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 these crack stories about what you heard. We don't want none of it. We want to be fully justified in ourselves on why we want to kill Jesus. Hey, so you don't even get none. That's, it's, it, that's, that's, a, that's a trippy, you know, that's just my observation on it. You know, just like you guys, they're, they're having here. They want to kill Jesus so bad that they're having this hearing on it, you know, but don't even want to hear anybody else's testimony. They just want to kill Jesus on their own, on their own accord. But they really, they want to, um, they, they're, they're so desperate to try to square it with the law so they can just be fully justified in, in Jesus's execution. Um, let's see. At 40, no, sorry, at 60. Then the high priest stood up before them, before the ball. And questioned Jesus, don't you have an answer to what these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer anything. Again, the high priest questioned him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? <clears throat> and Jesus said, I am, baby. Okay, <clears throat> start, we'll stop right there. I am. <laughs> Now, for anybody trying to say that Jesus, that the, well, the Bible never says that, that, that Jesus uh, is God, and the Bible never says that Jesus is the Son of God, and, and Jesus himself never said that he's God, and Jesus never said that he's the Son of God, uh, false. Falsely, false, false, false. And what people, people who say that, one, have not read the Bible, you have not asked for the Lord's counsel, the author of the Bible, you know, about what it says, and you have been deceived into repeating traditions of Islam. In the, in the book of Islam, in Al-Quran, the Bible rejects Jesus as the Son of God, rejects him as God. That's the Quran talking. That's what you're repeating if you go out there saying that the Bible never says that Jesus made such a claim or anything like that. You never got that from the Bible. You got that from the Quran. It's, they're already brainwashing you. You don't even know it. Um, so I am, okay, so Jesus says, I am, okay, because that's what God refers to himself as, I am, and says, and you all, you all, all of you, will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. <clears throat> and then the, the high priest tore his robes and said, why do we need witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to beat him, saying prophesy. Even the temple police tried to get them some and even slapped him. Hey, so they did Jesus real dirty. They gave, you know, they jumped him. Um, okay, now I wanted to back up a little bit uh, just to kind of illustrate how um, Jesus' disciples didn't get it. As you see right here, what Jesus said set them off. They got triggered, man. They got triggered when, when Jesus said what he said. To show that the disciples didn't really get where Jesus is coming from. Remember when we had read that, they asked, hey, Jesus, you know, which, you know, which one of us gets to sit it to your right and to your left, right? Okay, that statement right there was blasphemy. It was blasphemy, blasphemy for them to say, which one of us gets to sit to your right and to your left? It would have been blasphemy if they understood who Jesus was. They didn't, they still didn't get that they're talking to God. Because you can't, you can't assume to say, hey God, can I sit at your right and your left hand? You can't say that. That's 
punishable by death to even say that you can even be in the presence of God in such a manner. So when they said that to Jesus, they didn't they still didn't understand that they were talking to God. So they're still thinking that Jesus is going to establish he's they still think he's an earthly king, if anything. So they so just just to point that out, a little side note, they still didn't get it that they were talking to God and, and making that request to him. OK, so they commit they condemn to be worthy of death. All right. So we talked about how they jumped him. Now we're at uh, Fort, uh, Mark 14, 66. While Peter was in the courtyard below, one of the high priest's servants came. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, Hey, hey, you, you were with that Nazarene, Jesus. Right? We discussed what a Nazarene is. Like, you were with that, you were with that hood rat. You were with that hood rat Jesus. Or, or whatever pejorative that they use, because Nazarene, you know, was like a pejorative statement. Um, and Nazarene, uh, by the way, it means like separated, sanctified, you, you set apart. That's what the roots of the word means, you know, from, from Nazir. So Nazarene, Nazarite, Nazareth, it's like set apart. Um, <clears throat> but he denied it. I don't know what you're talking about, girl. You better leave me alone. What you, what, what, what you, what you talking about? Um, then he went out to the entryway and a rooster crowed. Oh, snap. Wait a minute. Okay. Then, when a servant saw him again, she began to tell those standing nearby, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing there said to Peter, 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 hey, you, you remember what Jesus said? You're going to forgive him the temptation, man. You're going to be tempted to save your own skin. And here it is. Peter, going to sleep on Jesus again. Peter, again, you certainly are one of them, since you're also a Galilean. Now remember what I was saying about Jesus being from Galilee? And Nazareth is just kind of like this, you know, place of Galilee where the Galileans come from that people kind of frown upon. <clears throat> it's a condition, condition of the, of the area. Then he started to curse and to swear with an oath. He started to curse and swear with an oath. I don't know this man that you're talking about. Immediately, a rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered when Jesus had spoken the word to him before the rooster crows twice. You will deny me three times. When he thought about it, he began to weep. And, um, and when you dig deeper into the word weep uh, in, in, um, in uh, the original writings, it's like he, he, he just he broke down, right? I mean, just, just cracked up. This wasn't like, like <laughs> I betrayed by Jesus. <laughs> no, this was just like fall out, ripped apart. He, he, was, he was just, he was broken. Uh, for for uh, selling out for selling out Jesus. All right, y'all. I think I'm gonna let me see. So next chapter will be 15. I'm gonna pick it up from 15. All right. I hope uh, I hope I said something, you know, uh, um, useful and enlightening for there. And you know, um, one of the reasons why I do this, y'all, is because, and you know, I'm re I'm reading this like chapter by chapter, verse by verse, because there's too much. There's um, there's just too much of people kind of making, you know, Jesus in their own image, you know? And, um, you know, a lot of people out there call themselves Christians. You know, you got these candy coated Christians out there, you know, assuming to, you know, kind of make uh, uh, Jesus out to be this, this figure that they want him to be, you know, according to their ideals. And y'all, that has to stop. Jesus was awesome. You know, Jesus is, is the man. We don't have to try to try to make something else out of Jesus. Jesus is, is king of kings. What his word says he is is what his word says he is. And y'all, that is more than good enough. Okay? Um, you know, there's, there's, and so I, you know, I, I, I just want to do my little part and just read it. You know, read, let's just read it verse by verse. Let's find out who Jesus is. Let's, you know, let's ask him. Ask the king of kings. You know, show us. Show us who you are. You've given us your word. Help us to understand it. Let us dig into who you are and not try to make up some image of who you are. To fit ourselves, you know, spit our view. None of that. That's one of the problems that, you know, that we're having, like with the church and with society and stuff like that. We're trying to make Jesus out to be something to fit us. Y'all, if we would just, if we would dig on Jesus for what he says he is, oh man, the world would be a better place. Okay? And then one day, uh, you know, he's, he's going to step on the scene and he's going and he's going to rule. And, and I hope that we're all together, man. I hope we're all together in that, with that, with that. That super awesome party hits, right? When that party hits, I hope we're all there, man. I hope we're all there because we 
want to know Jesus for exactly who he is, not according to what we think he should be. All right, y'all. Y'all have an awesome night. God bless you. Thank you so much. Have a fantastic weekend. Thanks for chilling with me. Or, or should I say tripping with me? <laughs>